guys, welcome back to Revive School, Lesson 76, John 8. All right, let's just hit the ground running, shall we? Kevin, we're talking about seven I am's. We've only covered one I am. Which one on the, the famous painting have we already covered, Kevin? The bread over on the right hand side. That's awesome. Now this is our second one. We're gonna get into John 8. We're gonna have our second I am super excited. But before we get there, we gotta tell a story. We got to tell a story in verses 1 through 11 to build the case on why Jesus said what he said about I am in John 8. And so many of you know the story. This is the classic story in church and Sunday school. But in verse 1 of John 8, it says this, But Jesus, he went to the Mount of Olives, okay? And then early in the morning at dawn, he went to the temple complex again. And this is cool to me. And all the people were coming to him. So what does he do? He sits down, it says, and he began to teach them. So we do know that all of the people mentality, remember, where did we just come from in John 7? The Feast of the Tabernacle. So all of these visitors were probably just winding down. Some of them haven't made, uh, made their, their journey back home yet. So here you have many visitors and there's, there's probably still a large crowd. So they're intrigued about, wait, wait, Jesus just started talking about being thirsty. Let's hear more of what this guy has to say. And so that's exactly what they do. And then in verse three, then it says, then the scribes and the Pharisees, one of the only times you'll see that phrase together in the Gospel of John. So the religious and the religious, <laughs> they brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Now I gotta tell you, this is super odd. Here he is in the temple complex, here he is teaching, and in the middle of all of this, the Pharisees try to, as one commentator says, Nelson says, they just try to interrupt his teaching. Let's just stir the pot if we can. And they try everything. Can you go to John 7, verse 45? You know, then the temple police came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they asked him, why haven't you brought him? In other words, they're looking for him. They're looking for trouble. They're looking to stir the pot. And so here's what they do. The temple police, they didn't bring Jesus in. So then they bring a, a person who's committed sin, right? All of a sudden, and they put her and make her stand in the center. Now in verse five, it says this, this is what they say to Jesus, the teacher. In the law, Moses commanded us, okay, to stone such women. Jesus, what do you say? Well, first of all, it's 100% a trap. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22, verse 23. If there is a young woman who is a virgin engaged to a man and, and another man encounters her in the city and has sex with her, verse 24, you must take the two of them out to the gate of the city and stone them to death. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's fiance. You must purge the evil from you. Now, Kevin, just, just one more verse. Go to Leviticus 20, verse 10, okay? That's one of the scenarios, just so you have a different perspective that Moses writes. In Leviticus 20, verse 10, it's another setup. It says, if a man commits adultery with a married woman, if he commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. If they see her or somebody sees her in the act, it means she's with somebody else. Why on earth did they not bring the someone else? They only brought the woman and they go, okay, Jesus, what would you say? Now here, interesting enough, Nelson says this, if Jesus had chosen not to stone her, because right, that's what they're saying, you need to stone her. If he had said not to stone her, he would have then contradicted the law. But then if Jesus had said to stone her, he would have run counter to the Roman law and Jews weren't allowed to carry out their own execution. So it's a no win either, either way. So in verse six, uh, this is really what it says. They asked this to trap him in order that they might have evidence to accuse him probably going against the law. And it says, Jesus stooped down and started writing on the ground with his finger. We don't know what he is drawing, but let me give you some options, okay? One of them, Nelson says, is that he would have written the Ten Commandments based on Exodus 20. All right, Kevin, let's go to Exodus 31, 18 if we can. When he finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. So naturally, when you see Jesus stooping down and he's writing something with his finger, people then equate Exodus 31, 18 all the way to Exodus 20. He's writing the two tablets. Okay, it, it actually, it's not a far, uh, far stretch to say that's exactly what he could have been doing. Now, maybe it's, here's a key, and I love what Nelson says. Maybe it's not about what he wrote, 
but about the act of writing. Maybe he was showing, and I think this is such a cool phrase, maybe he's showing that he's not a teacher of the law, but he's the giver of the law. Again, I can't prove any of this, but to me, those are good, those are good verses. There's a couple, though, that I really like. And again, it's fun to speculate, isn't it? Because nobody knows. This isn't 100% truth about, yes, this is exactly what he wrote. But Kevin, can you go to J Jeremiah 17, verse 13? Jeremiah 17, verse 13. I think I love, I love this picture here. It says this, Lord, and it's at the end, but I'll, I'll build it up here. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away from me will be written in the dirt, for they have abandoned the fountain of living water, the Lord. Now, the reason many people even think that this is even a possibility is in John 7, or John, yeah, John 7, we just talked about the living water, right? We just talked about, uh, like, I want to tap into the streams of the living water. Now, Kevin, can you go back to Jeremiah 17, verse 13? Think about this. It just says, for they have abandoned the fountain of living water, written in dirt. What, what if he just started writing all of their names? All who turn away from me will be written in the dirt, for they have abandoned the fountain of living water, the, word, the Lord. I, I don't know, but like, dude, that's my name. I'm pretty sure I didn't tell that guy my name. You know, imagine if he just starts having the, the, the gifts of knowledge, because he's Jesus, he's the son of God, and he starts writing all their names down about things that they've abandoned or things that they've turned away. I just something personal. And Jeremiah 13, 17, 13, maybe fits the mold. What do you think? Have you ever heard that before, Kevin? Never heard that before, but it'd be pretty, pretty intimidating. Yeah, uh, don't write anymore. We're good, you know, kind of deal. Yeah, it would be intimidating, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's a thought. Okay, let's just go to one more. Can you go to Exodus 23, uh, verse 1? Yeah, so in Exodus 23, verse 1, it just says this, you must not spread a false report. So maybe he is writing a couple things about people's names. Again, this whole thing about writing down the reports, um, writing about who they are. And again, maybe just this right here is all a lie. Like in the sense of maybe this whole adultery thing, doesn't, it's not even real. That makes sense? Maybe this whole thing about them saying, uh, this is an adulterer, adulteress, maybe it's not. He, he knows that. Do not join the wicked to be a malice, malicious witness. All right, now watch this. If we can go to verse 7, if we can, in John 8, okay? It says, when they persisted in questioning him, right? So he stood up because he's busy writing, and this is what he said. The one without sin among you, yeah, go ahead. You should be the first to throw a stone at her. He knows, he, he knows the law. Leviticus 24, verse 14, pretty clear. You would think that they would have figured out there's a hole in their approach. Bring the one, Scripture says, right, who has cursed to the outside of the camp and have all who have heard him lay their hands on his head and then look what everybody does. Then have the whole community stone him. So if this is going to happen, you stone him first. Okay, well, I'm not sure about that one. Just go to Deuteronomy 13, 9. Again, Jesus is just simply using the law to say, fine, you back this up if this is what you believe. Instead, Deuteronomy 39, instead you must kill him. Your hand is to be the first against him to put him to death, and then the hands of all the people. You found this person, you found this person guilty, you're the first one to stone him. And if you don't believe that one, let's go to Deuteronomy 17, verse 7. Wouldn't that be awesome if he just started rattling off all of these verses? Deuteronomy 17, 7, the witness's hands are to be the first in putting him to death. And then after that, the hands of all the people. You must purge the evil from you. So if you really think that adultery took place, now you must stone him. If you don't, then it becomes murder. So Jesus heightened the whole thing here. And I love, based on his answers, Jesus very clearly, as Nelson says, the commentary, he doesn't abolish Moses' law. He just simply applied the law to those that accused her. It just says in verse 8, then he stooped down again and continued writing on the ground. He either has to write all of their names because he's got more sins <laughs> for them. Maybe he's not done writing Jeremiah 17. Maybe he hasn't finished the 8th, the ninth, and the 10th commandment. I don't know which one you're at, but he begins to write even more. 
And then in verse 9, when they heard this, starting with the older men, only Jesus was left. So because the old are going to have a tendency to have more of a conscience. I mean, I think that's true. They've been down the road. They begin to understand things. These guys realize this is a lie. This is a trap. We get this. And so then they begin to leave. And so only Jesus was left with the woman in the center. Now, uh, one commentator said that this whole thing could have happened literally in just minutes, this whole interaction. I'll tell you why that's important, because you remember the time of the day? The time of the day was, right, in verse 2, at dawn, early in the morning, he went to the temple complex, okay? Just hold that thought, okay? So if this happened just briefly. Now, it says this in verse 10. When Jesus stood up, he said to her. So he's been bending down, riding. Now he's standing up. Woman, where are they? Kind of like he doesn't even know because he was sitting, looking down writing. He's so confident. Hey, hey, where'd they go? Has no one, has no one condemned you? I love that question. Verse 11, it says this. No, no one, Lord. She answered, neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go from now on, do not sin anymore. What this implies is that one, he, he forgives her. Two, he actually doesn't condemn her. I'm not, I'm not condemning you, but he also doesn't, and I love what the commentator Nelson says, but he also doesn't condone her sin. He doesn't accept and allow this. So I'm just going to go straight for the, the elephant in the room. Okay. When there's sin in the room, you can forgive that person. When there's sin in the camp, you can forgive that person. But it doesn't mean they can live in that lifestyle of sin. It doesn't mean that they can continue to walk this out. He's saying, I am not here to condemn you. I forgive you. I release you. But you cannot live in this lifestyle any longer. So do you welcome homosexuals into your church? Absolutely. Absolutely. You love on them and you reveal to them the truth that Jesus wants to forgive all. Do you welcome alcoholics? Absolutely. You welcome them in. Do you, do you welcome in people that have pornof- pornography addictions? Absolutely. Those that are stuck on drugs? Absolutely. You welcome them in. You reveal Christ can truly set them free. Christ can forgive them. But you cannot accept and allow and endorse to continue on in that lifestyle. That's not true love. And I love about what Jesus says. He says, but go and sin no more. So this whole message of let's love all, let's embrace all, we welcome all. Absolutely, we do. But then you must say and go and sin no more. You have to put both of those taglines on. Otherwise, I think you're loving them right in their sin. And I think you're loving them literally right to that point where they do not see who Christ really is. Christ does not say, neither do I condemn you. He adds the line, go and from now on do not sin anymore. I think this is where we've gone wrong in the American church. We've compromised and we've allowed all these different lifestyles to trickle into our church and then we're never saying what it is. It's sin. Adultery is sin. Gambling is sin. Drinking to the point of getting drunk is sin. All of these things, if they become a lifestyle, he says, I do not condemn you, but go and sin no more. This, it's got to stop. It has to stop. Otherwise, what Christ did on the cross, it didn't mean anything. And so because of early in the morning, because Jesus is saying to this woman, OK, I'm, I'm here for you, but don't live in this lifestyle. Look what happens in verse 12. OK, in verse 12, it says this. Now, Jesus spoke to them again. And what does he say? I am the light of the world. Now, remember, he was having a conversation right before this, Kevin. Yeah, but then they all leave. So who's he talking to? Yeah. So now we're back in the temple complex. So just the religious and the scribes that came to him, that were here to set the trap with the adulterous woman, they all left. And it's just kind of like it was an interruption. (laughs) It was an interruption of these people. So then he spoke to them again and he said, but everybody heard the interaction, right? Everybody heard that whole scenario. Anyone, he says, look at this. Jesus spoke to them again. He said, I am the light of the world. John 6, we said, I am the bread of life. Now, Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. Remember, anytime he's tying the word I am, he's tying it back to Moses, back to God. When God said to Moses, I am who I am. He is saying, I am God. And now he's saying, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. The reason verse 12 makes sense is because of verse 11. 
Verse 11, he clearly says, go and sin no more. So how do you, in verse 12, Kevin, if you'll go there, how do you then not walk in darkness? Is that you walk behind the light? Think about this. You go and sin no more because as you go and sin no more, you have to have the light of Christ right in front of your face. It's the Psalm 119, 105. It's, it's truly this picture of Psalm 119, 105 says, I am going to be a lamp to your feet, right? So if you don't want to walk in the darkness, the scripture says clearly, he says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. If you are in Christ, if you're allowing the light of the world to take over, he becomes a lamp for your feet. You have every step taken and it's a light for your path. I mean, it's a cool picture, but if you want to go back to the adulterous lifestyle, if there ever was one, he says, then if you're, if you're going to go back to it, it's because you're not involving the light of the world. And that's what I've concluded in the American society of those that claim to be followers of Christ. It's the biggest lie ever, you guys. You're going back to the darkness and you're not allowing the light of the world to change your, to change your life. Man, there's a lot of pictures here with the word light. Uh, and I like this image. Remember I told you it was at the dawn when Christ was having this discussion and, and the, the religious came to the table. Uh, Nelson says this, as the sun is the physical light of the world. You know how Jesus just uses imagery. You wonder if he just pointed to the sun. As the sun is, becomes the light to the world, I become the spiritual light of the world. I mean, Jesus clearly in verses 1 through 11, what does he do? He exposes sin. But in, in chapter 9, really 1 through 7, you're going to see a blind man being healed. What does he do? He gives sight. Jesus truly exposes sin and gives light. And so Jesus, here it is again, and I am. What does he say? If you'll go back, Kevin, to Luke. Uh, let's go back to verse 12 when he says, I am the light of the world. Now, this is our second one. And I'll write this up here. I am the bread of life. You know, there's something about understanding when you begin to understand this picture. And you begin to understand all of the I am's, who Christ in your life, it's, it's almost like he just begins to radically change your perspective in, in everything. If he really is your light, he'll, he'll give you the next step. Jesus is the light of the world. You can't go back to the sin. No, no, no. He says, now you'll walk as if you have the light of the light of life. You know, in the Old Testament, light, as Dr. Tom Constable says, light was always associated with God's presence. Think about this. In Genesis 1, God created light on the first day. And then lights were made on the fourth day. You know, uh, in Moses, in Exodus 3, a, a, a flame, that light, always revealed God's presence. A cloud of fire in Exodus 13 revealed God's presence. Anytime there was this, this light image, it sensed God's presence. Now, Kevin, if you would, would you go to, and this, is a, this is a fun one for me, Isaiah 49, verse 6. It is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the projected ones of Israel. That's not just enough. I have more for you. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So prophetically, the prophet says, oh, by the way, the servant, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, he will also be a light to the nations. So any person in the temple complex that hears, I am the light of the world, they should naturally tie it into Isaiah 49, 6. I don't know. I think to me, this is a cool image. And then, you know, you guys, we talked about the Feast of Tabernacles uh, even just yesterday in John 7 and talking about the, the rivers of, of living water, right? Well, in the Feast of Tabernacles, they were always, every evening, the priests would always light three huge um, uh, the candelabras in the women's court, and you know that, that always, always symbols, symbolized God's presence. I think to me it's a pretty powerful statement when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. We're going to see if we have time. I, I'm going to try, okay? I love what Nelson's did, and to me this is a pretty radical picture of the rest of the interaction of John chapter 8. I never thought I would teach like this. But I think this is really important, okay? So a couple things. One is you're going to see these constant questions, okay? Okay, so there's a question, okay? And, or a statement that the religious are always making, okay? So we know that in verses, and because of time I'm not going to teach this, I'm going to make statements on this. In verses 12 through 20, this is the claim that they make, okay? You have, this is, they're talking to Jesus, you have not 
proven your case. Okay, in other words, we don't agree with why you say what you say. So what does Jesus say, okay? In verse 12, he clearly says, this was one of his responses, I am the light of the world, okay? That's one of his responses to the challenge, okay? You haven't proven your case, but he also says, if you would, Kevin, uh, would you go to verse 14? He also then, and I'm going to summarize this one, he says in verse 14, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is valid. Remember, we talked about the comparing my testimony is valid because I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. So the way Jesus countered this was he says, I know my origin. Jesus clearly knows where he comes from and he knows where I'm going, his destiny. So Jesus's argument to you have not proven your case he then says, I am the light of the world and I know my origin and my destiny. I think this is important to understand because sometimes when we teach just on the I am the light of the world, I, I think you don't fully understand the context. We know that's in response to the adulterous uh, scenario, but it's even a, it's a bigger picture. It's the religious always going after Jesus. So this is the undergird, underlining tone. And then look what he says in verse 15. He says another way that he responds, he says, you judge by human standards. And then what does he say? I judge no one. So Jesus continually is, is communicating his I am's. He is communicating who he, who he is. Okay, now let's keep going because of time. Okay, in verse 18, okay, verses nine, really 19 and 20, Verses 19 through 20, here's another one of their questions, and I'm not going to write the word down. They are asking, where is your father? Okay, and that comes into verses 19 through 20. So look, it says, where is your father? Then they asked him, where's your father? You, not, you know neither me nor my father, Jesus said. If you knew me, you would also know my father. <laughs> he spoke these words by the treasury while teaching in the temple complex. So one of the questions they had was just, where's your father? They've said, you haven't proven your case. Where is your father? And so the reason I want to camp out, and I know this is going to feel more theological, and I know this is going to feel like a little bit more substance, but I'm telling you, John 8 is all about this interaction. Remember in John 7, 37, we said it's going to turn a corner. Remember once he started talking about the spirit of God, it was like the religious were going at him harder and harder. And how do you combat these things? This is what Jesus says. Okay, now there's one more question, one more claim that they come before he begins an answer. And it's, it's crazy in verses 21 through 24, uh, they thought he was going to kill himself. So will he, meaning Jesus, kill himself? Okay, that comes through again, verses 21 through 24. Now you can say, well, what, what in the world are we talking about here? Watch. It says, then he said to him again in verse 21, I'm going away, you will look for me and you will die on your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where am I going? You cannot come. And so this is the question. You are from below, he said. I am from above. So how does he respond to will he kill himself? He says, I am from above. And then he says at the same time, look, you are of this world. I am not of this world. So another one of his claims is I am not of this world. And once I started studying this way about Christ, something changed in my perspective. I began to see, uh, really, how does Christ respond? And then how does the religious ask? Does that make sense? To me, it's kind of like, okay, Jesus responded, my, I am the light of the world. I, I know where I'm from. Oh, by the way, I'm not of this world. You guys, this should all be us. In so many respects, we should be a reflection of, of Christ. And then I love this in verses 25 through 32. Look at the one question that they ask. Who are you? <laughs> I don't understand. Who are you? And he says precisely what I've been telling you from the very beginning. In other words, have you not been listening? <laughs> and then he, <laughs> he says in verse 26, and this is an awesome claim. He says, I speak. And you guys, here's the truth, what we need to hear. I speak what I hear from my father. In other words, I only speak in our context what the Holy Spirit says to us. The Spirit of God will give us what we need to say. Well, who are you? Just let the Spirit of God speak through you. Haven't I already been telling you this and over and over again? And then he gives you another claim, okay? I want to just say this. And he says this in 26. He says this in 28. And he says this in 29, okay? Three different times he begins to reiterate, I have been sent by the Father and I only speak what I hear. 
Okay, so here you have the questions. Jesus is clearly responding, right, with his response. I think all of these truths, if you just took the green highlights, you would begin to say, man, how can I learn more like Christ like that? How can I camp out more on this emphasis? Now, in verses 33 through 38, they have another question. How can you say you will be made free? Now, if you knew nothing about the scenario and you knew nothing about the religious and you interacted with lost people, this is an awesome question. How can you say you're free? I want to experience this freedom. I don't understand. How do you tap into this? And so when you begin to look at the religious questions, you guys, a lot of people are asking these questions. These are ways that we can learn how to interact with the lost. These are how ways that we can interact with the religious. And then in 34 through 38, you guys, what you have is, is more of that questioning, more of that scenario. And then I know we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna cram this in, you guys. We're going to do this. And another question is they claim, okay, this is kind of a biggie, but you need to understand this, that Abraham and God, okay, as their father. So they claim that both are their father in verses 39 through 47. And you know what Jesus, <laughs> you know what Jesus says in verse 42? Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. You would love me because I came from God and I am here. But I did not, for I did not come on my own, but he sent me. So you know what Jesus' claim is? And this is one that we won't use when we interact with people. I am God. Why is that important? Because we are to reflect Christ here on earth. This is how we're supposed to live, you guys. And then there's one more question. Well, there's multiple questions, but because of time, uh, we have another one where they talk about Jesus having a demon, right? Do you guys remember that in verses 48 through 51? Okay, that has actually happened to us out on the streets. Oh, you're the ones, you're the crazies that have a demon. And then they ask another question. Are you, are you uh, greater than Abraham? So then they ask about Abraham again. And then this is where we've used this line. Jesus says this again, I know God. So again, I am God. And then he says, I know God, right? Every time, you guys, Jesus' response, every time is as he goes back to the truth. You want to learn how to interact with the religious in your community? You want to know how to interact with the lost? This is a great chapter to study on Jesus, how he interacts with people. And then they say, have you seen Abraham? Do you know Abraham? And then he says the craziest verse that really throws everybody for a loop in verse 58. And I love this one. He said, I assure you, before Abraham was, and this is why I wanted to end here today, he says, I am. And that's exactly what Jesus is showing. And that's exactly what's throwing them off over and over again is Jesus is claiming he is God. Now, I know there's a lot there. We've talked about the light of the world and how we need to live in the light, not in the darkness. But then I also want to show to you guys, the more that Jesus is forward about who he is, the more the religious have the questions and the claims and the more Jesus then responds with truth. I know those are some messy notes, but my prayer is, is that you would begin to learn how to respond in love, in listening, in discerning, and responding to every person the way that Christ did. It's an awesome picture. Jesus was in the beginning, He is here now, and He'll be there at the end. It's a fun chapter, guys. John chapter 8. We'll talk to you tomorrow.